welcome to another edition of YPR. I'm Amanda Rodriguez. And I'm Benjamin Scott. Today we'll visit a camp where kids are hanging out with a rock legend and meet a group of local kids who have their eyes on the Olympics. We'll also visit a place that puts you on the right track to fun and we'll take flight with a group of YPR reporters. But first, we're at the Sloan Museum in Flint. Camille Rundaway took a look around and filed this report. You may have seen some of these items in history books or old movies. But here in Flint, you can see them in person. When in time do most of your displays come from? They come from as far back as when the Indians were first here, about 12,000 years ago, all the way up to the present. We have a lot of Indian artifacts um, date way, way back. We have three settings from the 1800s, the early 1800s with the fur traders, and the pioneers, the middle 1800s with a general store, and then a Victorian parlor. And we have a lot of things from Flint's history, which is very unique. Some of the exhibits may have strange items that you don't recognize, but I bet your parents and grandparents do. This section shows a little about what life was like in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. One of the more popular attractions here at the Sloan Museum takes you out of the home and into the garage. That's right. You will find cars, cars, and more cars. General Motors was started here in 1908. The, the seeds of it were earlier, and they can see a story about our town and all the goods and the bads and the ups and the downs that our town has gone through in all of these years, almost 100 years of automotive business here in Flint. At the Sloan Museum, you can spend a day exploring the past and finally see what you've read about in your history books. In Flint, I'm Camille Rondaway, reporting for YPR. During the summer, a lot of kids will be heading off to camp. Kyle McIntosh visited one camp that had a small bonus. The campers get to hang out with a rock legend. He has our story. So you have a few months off school. What are you going to do? You could stay home all summer and hang out, or you could experience life beyond the pavement. When I was a little boy, I played with all of my toys I had my favorite puppy dog Like other girls and boys And I had my bow and arrow I take it to the woods I've seen how America has slowly but surely removed itself from the ground in our cities and I thought I would take the city folk back to the earth. Here at Ted Nugent's Camp for Kids, you can do the usual camp stuff, but the theme of the weekend is built around archery. If you've never picked up a bow before, don't worry. You can start from scratch. Well, all you really need to get started is, uh, is a bow and arrow. We learn how to, first of all, uh, be safe around our archery equipment. We learn safety techniques and handling not only the bows, but the arrows. I've learned about like hunting and the safety of it. I've learned how to shoot my bow better and a lot about the outdoors. Kids travel from all over the country to participate in this unique outdoor experience. We have boys and girls from 11 to 15 years old. We have kids from literally every state in the whole United States. They learn hands-on hunting and conservation along with other recreational activities. I've learned how to take care of people if they get hurt and um, how to go up in tree stands. It's definitely fun, and if you want, if you don't want to hunt, that's okay, because you don't learn just about hunting, you learn about other things. Well, kids nowadays have an awful lot of choices. There's a lot of choices that are less than ideal, and I know that every time a child goes into the outdoors and learns about nature and learns that the quality of our air, soil, and water will determine the fulfillment of our life's dreams, that that's a lesson that could be missed if it weren't for camps like this. The campers learn about archery, but more importantly, sportsmanship. But it's Ted himself who delivers a very important message during his presentation. And how do I know if I'm doing the right thing? Because there's these 10 rules called the commandments. And there's another one called the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And then there are laws so that we are safe. He focuses on self-esteem, family values, and a strict code of discipline and ethics as the basis for the hunt and life in general. Everybody goes, well, Ted, you've been to all the most exciting places in the world to hunt. What's your favorite? And I said, 
wherever my son's with you. Ted also weaves a strong anti-drug, anti-alcohol message into his presentation, encouraging kids to experience the natural highs that are found in an outdoor lifestyle. If you're going to feel alive and feel a little cocky, Clayton, <laughs> you've got to be in charge of your life. And in order to be in charge of your life, that means no drugs and no alcohol and no tobacco and no poisons and no stupidity. That we would take these kids and give them a, 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 a alternative to uh, drugs, alcohol, and hanging around in the malls. You see, they got high and now they're dead. I went hunting and I'm still Ted. That's how that works. The kids ended camp shooting with Ted. Even I got a chance to join in on the fun. You gotta leave. We're starting on a salad, right? No matter what your hunting skills are, this camp provides a fun and memorable experience. Besides, where else can you get this close to a rock star? From Ted Nugent's Camp for Kids in Caseville, I'm Kyle McIntosh reporting for YPR. We have to take a break, but when we come back, we'll visit a place where kids are having fun riding the rails. Don't go away. There's much more to come on YPR. Bus, cars, cabooses, and tracks are part of a hobby you're interested in, then Sean Chiplock found the perfect place for you. He has our story. So you say that you like trains. How would you like to own one? That's right. You can have your very own train. They come in all different models. But what if you want to be able to go for a ride? Then you'll have to build a bigger one, like the one here at Junction Valley Railroad in Bridgeport. Well, I started it back in 1979 while the family was on vacation. And me and a dog stayed home that weekend and we started building it. We built one car that weekend. What makes this place so unique is that it's the largest quarter sized railroad in the world. And if you want a railroad just like this one, you're going to have to do some serious building. To start out with, I had to save a lot of money. It took me 40 years to save up enough money to get started. I was a little boy about smaller than you when I wanted to build this railroad. The wife, the kids all helped me at first. Now I got employees even help me, help me run the railroad, help me build it. This railroad has almost four miles of track and eight fully equipped engines with over 62 cars of all types, kinds, and sizes. Not to mention all of the bridges and the tunnel that's over 100 feet long. My favorite part of the railroad is riding down on the train because you ride like all over the place and it's a lot of fun. It's very entertaining and fun. It's fun to just like play on the playground and have fun with your family. Once you've built your train and laid your track, you're going to have to learn to be an engineer. After all, if you have a train, you should know how to operate it. Get in there and I'll show you what it does. Yeah. See all this here? Yeah. That's a swallow. That makes the train go fast. Oh. This here is the hydraulic file to control the, the traction effort. This over here is the independent brake. This here is the car brake. These are the booster switches. Speed the engines up, slow them down. You know what this is, of course. Uh, yeah. What do you think that is? It makes that large sound that hurts my ass. Like that? Yeah. <laughs> this here is all the instruments. Shows you how fast the train goes. Uh -huh. I have temperature, the air pressures, uh -huh. everything else about the engines. Oh, cool. If you don't have tons of time and a small fortune to invest into your train, you might want to stick with the smaller version and come here to go for a ride. From Junction Valley Railroad in Bridgeport, I'm Sean Cheplock reporting for YPR. Riding on a train can be a lot of fun, but if you're looking for a more uplifting experience, then our next story is for you. Adam Hallibuck explains. Everybody knows what that's called, don't they? Yep. What's that called? Propeller. Yeah. These kids are about to take flight. No, they're not going on vacation, just going flying. What's even more unusual about this is that they will be in the pilot seat. It's all part of the Young Eagles program, which aims to reach one million kids like these by the year 2003. 
It's a voluntary program where the pilots donate their time to their airplane and uh, we'll, we'll take the youngster up and give him a, a ride and an introduction to flight for absolutely nothing. You have to fill out the forms, have your parents give their consent, sign the papers and that's it. They say at the sky and the child's imagination have no limits. From up here you see the connection. The view is amazing. In the air you can see everything. We flew over my house and my school and they look so small from the air. All the kids who flew with us had the same reaction. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. I just, it was fun to see you go up and then you go mm, up and down. It was fun. It was really neat. I got to, I got to do the controls. It was really neat. We went pretty high. I think he said we went to 3,000 feet. We went over the, I think it was the Saginaw Bay, and we um, got to see the other plane, and we flew real close to each other, and it was real fun. It's definitely a great experience. From the skies above mid-Michigan, I'm Adam Hellebuck reporting. We have to take another break, but when we come back, we'll take a look at a sport that has some local kids dancing in the waves. Don't go away. This time of year, swimming pools are very popular, but a group of local kids are doing more than just swimming. They're dancing in the water. Abby Wajno has our story. Two, three, four, side. Two, three, four, back. A bunch of kids in the pool pretending to be dolphins hardly seems like it could be a sport, but it is, and it's a lot harder than it looks. Not only is this a sport, it's an Olympic event, it's called synchronized swimming, and these kids are learning the fine art of water ballet. These girls are fantastic. They're very enthusiastic, and they are very good swimmers. It's um, fun. You get to meet a lot of different people, and you get to do a lot of different dances in the water. It's fun because you meet a lot of new friends, and you, um, you get good exercise, and it cools you off. combines complex swimming skills and graceful movements set to music. These kids may make it look easy, but anyone involved knows better. You can't just swim. You have to listen to the music at the right time, and you have to um, understand the, your um, moves and your strokes. It's a lot of skill, a lot of strength, a lot of endurance, breathing skills, because a lot of it is done underwater, and you have to be very strong. It relaxes you, um, it's fun to do, it teaches you to be um, self-respective, um, it makes you a better swimmer and you have stronger legs and stronger arms. It's like you feel like you feel really good because you're part of a team and you get to learn different things and just have fun and go different places. But these girls are more than just the team. They're close, like sisters. In a way, we're like sisters because it's a specialized sport and not everyone knows it. And it's, it's just like a family. For more information about synchronized swimming, call the YWCA in Bay City. I'm Abby Voina reporting for YPR. The water those kids performed in, that you swim in, that we water our yards with and even drink is clean. But it wasn't always. Patrice Ford took a look around a plant that takes the yuck out of our water. She explains. 
When you take a shower, wash your dishes, or mom and dad's car, most people really never give a second thought about where all that water goes. Today, I'm at the Saginaw Waste Water Treatment Plant to see how water that starts out looking like this is turned into this. This is one of the primary settling tanks. We have four primary settling tanks. These tanks hold 770,000 gallons of water each. Now the water, once it comes through the sewers and the material that we don't want in the water has been screened out with our bar screens, that water then goes through our grit channels where the grit settles out. The water then comes to the middle of, these, of the tanks, enters the tank through the middle, and this is the, the water that's leaving here is going to what we call a launder. That water then collects in another chamber over here near the stones, goes underground by a pipe, and it goes to the aeration tanks, to secondary treatment. That's where secondary treatment starts. This is where our, our solids settle out here. About 65% removal is done here in the primary settling tanks. Now the material that settles in the bottom of these tanks, we add lime to it to stabilize it. And that's the material that we pump uh, to our to the sludge storage tank. Okay, the, these are the aeration tanks. Uh, the water now has left the primary settling tanks and it comes into these tanks. There are four tanks. Each tank has a capacity of one and a half million gallons. The mixer that you see there, or the aerator, is uh, mixing the water up to provide oxygen for the, uh, the bugs or the microorganisms that are required for treating the wastewater here. So we have to maintain the, the proper environment for the bugs here so they don't die. Because the water, once it leaves the aeration tanks, it goes through a transfer channel and then enters into these, uh, these big tanks or the final settling tanks. The material that settles in the bottom of these tanks is uh, continuously returned to the, uh, the headworks or, or the uh, aeration tanks so the microorganisms can continue to feed its, its food for them. These tanks hold 1.3 million gallons of water. Now this is the water now that would uh, be leaving here and be going into the area uh, where the chlorine would be added to the water. The uh, chamber that you see in the grass area there, that is where we add the chlorine for disinfecting the water that we've uh, have treated at the plant here. And the tanks uh, behind me here are our chlorine contact tanks. Now at the end of the tanks is where we add another chemical, sulfur dioxide, is, and that is added to remove some of the chlorine. So when they're done treating the water, it ends up here, where it is then sent to the Saginaw River as clean water to be used again. From Saginaw, I'm Patrice Ford reporting for YPR. We have to take another break, but when we come back, we'll meet some local kids who have courtside seats for the area's hottest tennis match. Don't go away. Tennis has developed quite a following, and one group of local kids have made sure that they will have courtside seats to the hottest ticket in town. But they are going to do more than watch the game. They're going to become part of the action. Andrew Grafe has our story. I'm here to be um, a ball runner for the Dow Corning Tennis Tournament. I'll be ball running, um, probably at the net. You know, if they hit a ball in the net, I'll go and fetch it and <laughs> bring it back. And get it to the player somehow. Well, it's a um, women's professional tournament, and it's in the Challenger Series, and it's um, a tournament where the players that are kind of trying to establish themselves come to play. We're here to uh, get the ball kids involved with the tournament. They're here to keep the balls rolling around the court and assist the players on the court. Their job is to not be noticed. If we're not noticed on the court, that's good. Our job is to get the balls to the players without making a spectacle out there. We hand select all these kids. Uh, there's a lot of kids that wanted to be ball runners, but we have such a large list that 
we look for the ones that are going to be good role models during the tournament. They have to be good role models on and off the court. They have to know the full scoring of tennis and mainly people that are going to be good leaders. If you're a net runner, you have to be quick on your feet. You have to know where all the balls are. You have to be very aware and focused. Um, also, you have to have some kind of athletic ability to be able to pick up the ball as it's rolling along. It's kind of sounds easy, but it's harder than it sounds. After getting a few pointers about being a good ball runner, I thought I would give it a try. As I found out, running after ball, after ball, after ball, it can be a lot of hard work. But it's worth it when you get to be just a few feet from all the action. It's a lot of fun. I like, it's like, it's really cool being right near professional athletes and watching them play and watching them um, do well in their sport. It's really, it's a different kind of experience because you're actually standing in front of thousands of people and it's um, a really fun experience. I've been playing tennis for all my life and it's fun to come and see and watch the other players from all around the world like Germany, Japan, and they're top players in the world. And to come and watch them play is an experience for me and it will help me improve my tennis. Being a ball runner can be very difficult, but for these kids, it's the opportunity of a lifetime. From the Midland Community Tennis Center, I'm Andrew Grafe, reporting for YPR. Whenever the Olympics take place, kids all over the world watch in awe and dream of being there to compete. But a group of local kids are doing more than just dreaming. They're well on their way to compete for the gold. Lindsay Batchglupo has our story. For many kids, the martial arts are a good way of building self-confidence as well as getting a good workout. While some kids enjoy the thrill of having fun with their friends, for these kids in Midland, it's the thrill of competition that gets them on the mat every time. Here at Lim's Taekwondo Academy in Midland, these students have been practicing for the upcoming Junior Olympics in Las Vegas. Even though the competition is sure to be tough, this isn't anything they haven't handled before. Well, the students have been preparing themselves above and beyond what you might normally expect from young children. Not only do they come to their regular classes, but we have uh, competition classes several times a week, which lasts for a couple of hours. In it includes uh, endurance training, strength training, as well as technical training, where we practice our forms and we practice sparring one another, and also uh, to try to keep building up their confidence since it's such a huge event. Taekwondo is the Korean form of martial arts. Literally translated, it means the art of hand and foot. We use various foot techniques, hand techniques, um, and different motions. The things that we do in the competition are both forms competition and sparring competition. Forms competition is this, uh, various movements that are put into a certain sequence, and when done properly, it looks graceful, almost like ballet. Sparring competition is like the uh, controlled fighting, much of what you've seen here. Well, first of all, I like it because it's good for discipline, especially when I first started, I was about seven, so I was really good then. And also, the instructors are great. They teach you a lot of stuff. It's fun, and um, you get to go compete, and uh, working up to your way to a black belt is really an exciting event. Probably um, making yourself faster, and probably sparring forms. Well, I hope to do good, because that's what I've been practicing for. But I think I can at least get something, hopefully. Well, people say they es I expect to do good, and, s and I think I will do good, too. Because last year, I got a gold in sparring. <laughs> I'm going to try, and I hopefully I'll come home with some medals, um, maybe gold or silver or bronze. In Las Vegas, over 5,000 kids will be competing in the Junior Olympics to say that they are the best. Although the competition does sound staggering, with hard work and determination, these kids feel that they can tackle almost anything in their way. From Midland, I'm Lindsay Batchgalupo reporting for YPR. We've had a lot of fun here today at the Sloan Museum in Florida, but that's all the time we have for it this week. Thanks for joining us, and have a great weekend. And I'm Benjamin Scott. Today we'll visit a camper where, where? Oh my gosh. Come on. I, I ben, am, you are like. I, I am. Yeah. Where, where, where? Ah, uh, ah, uh, I've got uh, the power. Really? No. <laughs> See, I only had to do it one time. And one more for safety. No, you can't trick me. You can't give me a taste of my own medicine. I hate that stuff. Here, 
then our next story is for you. Adam Hallibuck explains. I said Hallibuck, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs>